first one that came in, should I sign my report? Should I tell my story or should I sell books? Well, I believe in singing for my supper. So I'd like to tell the story first. <laughs> Lake County had a chair of ghosts. Now, I've had a ghost story to my own life. When I was 14 years old, I visited my grandma in Bad Axe in Michigan. And about uh, two in the morning, I woke up out of a sound sleep. She had me in a, in a little cot next to her bed. And Grandma was sound asleep with a volume of covers over. It's wintertime. And outside my window, the moon was full that night. And it shone so bright, it was like dark, broad daylight. And I remember when I was 12 years old, I'd been left there while my mother and dad went to visit other relatives and a few miles away. And they picked me up the next morning. And for some reason, I woke up and saw this moonlight. Well, toward the back of Grandma's bedroom, there was a large walk in closet. It had been built years ago, and probably 10, 15 feet deep. No lights or anything there. It was a deep closet for her clothes. Out of the closet, I'm remembering what I saw as a 12 year old boy to this day. I it wasn't in my mind or it wasn't in The woman, all in black, came sliding out of the closet. And she stood by my bed and looked down at me just so she looked me curiously. Big star, but I could see her head. She had a very large hat on. Beautiful large hat. And I was frozen with fear. I said, I thought it was my grandmother. I said, Grandma, Grandma. And she rolled over in her covers maybe six feet away. She said, she said, go to sleep, Jean, go to sleep, Jean. And the lady turned around and glided back into the closet and disappeared. Well, I covered up my head now, how it was. But next thing I got it was morning, and she was cooking eggs in the kitchen, and she called me, and I got, it, got dressed. And I was convinced I had dreamed this. I said, Grandma, Something happened last night, and I told her the story. And she had the big hat on. And my grandmother looked at me and said, Jean, let me show you something. She went to the closet and brought out the same hat. And I said, that's the hat. She said, well, the hat was here when I bought the house, right, in this house. And there were stories, but uh, maybe I did see her after all. That was my one brush with a ghost story. That was back in Michigan, but here in Lake County, if you've ever gone to the county courthouse, you drive on Forbes Street, another block or so, and you'll get to a church. It's on the hill on the side, on the corner. It's painted white now, but when I first came here, nearly 50 years ago, it was blue, the blue church. That's what everyone called it. Well, that's a story in the book, and I'm not going to tell you the whole story about that one because it has a surprise ending, and you read it in the book or someone else's book. But I am going to tell you about three other stories that I think uh, you'll find interesting, and we're in the, in the book. Sweetheart, I was going to ask you for your help. Now I can see my nose more clearly and tell you the stories, and there are three of them. The Lonely Neighbor, The Empty Seat, and The Lavender Lady. They're all the Old John Binkley lived at the Baker residence in the winter of 1897. That's the present Walter C. Towles place in Big Valley. Can you hear me in the back? And are there any unusual sounds or reading? Not Am I clear? Yeah, we're not okay. here. Yeah. That's the present Walter C. Towles place in Big Valley. His neighbor, George R. Fitzgerald, visited John that night. Now, while they're seated in front of the fireplace, 
George didn't speak, he was quiet. And uh, John was, and uh, because John was acting strangely, while they were seated, John was staring at the coal with his thoughts, and meanwhile he was working and cleaning his shotgun. Well, John had reloaded his weapon, when out of clear sky he said to George, the visitor, I'm going to kill myself so I can go to heaven. And that was enough to John, knock George off his pins. With surprise, he added an unwelcome postscript. He said this, I'm going to kill you first, George, so we can go to heaven together. George knew by the tone of his voice and his attitude, John was dead serious. He wasn't joking. This posed quite a problem for George, because John Bickley was a strong man, and he was well armed for the situation. Not knowing what to do in this awkward situation, George said, John, I'm willing, understand I'm willing. Nevertheless, the room is growing chilly. The fire is dying, dying down in the, down to the embers, and I would like to go out and get an iron hold of wood. And that way we can leave this world in a more comfortable mm. position. All right, John agreed, and you know, John was, George was gone, lickety split, he went down, took to his heels, went to a cousin's house down the road. The Ellis family, the Theo Ellis family, was a relative, and uh, he was pressing for my old family. Well, when he got there, he told him what had happened, and he said, I'm going out in the barn to hide out. If, if John comes by and tell him I'm gone, John did come by with his gun, and gun in tow, and he said, is there a corpse in the house? Well, they're all dumb with fear. But he searched the house room by room, couldn't find George, and he left him. So, well, they called Sayer, who was sheriff at that time. And he came with his deputy uh, the next morning. He went to John's house. There he found John, who had blown his head off and killed himself. Then were afterward, the kids who walked by that house at night, and some of the adults, and this was, was related in the story to a Latin area, as the gospel drew, especially on dark nights, when the nights was kind of windy and mysterious. They swore they could hear the voice Watch for a little old lady, she was told. She will be wearing her gray shawl. 
When you see her, so when you see her, let us know. When the graduation ceremony was nearly over, the neighbor, still busy searching every door rival, was delighted to see, next to the mother, a little <coughs> white-haired old lady. About her shoulders was a lovely gray shawl trimmed in knitted black lace. Well, after the graduation, she singled out the mother of the girl who's graduating singer. I'm glad your mother came. And she turned to her and said, I'm so sorry, didn't you hear? She died on the way at the toll road, coming into the valley from Hoffman. And she said, well, who was that lady in gray in the place? Louder, yeah. Louder. And you hear, who was that lady? It's turned off. It's turned off. She asked, who was that lady sitting next to you who's wearing lovely gray knitted place uh, uh, shawl around her shoulders. It's on again. Tripped and knitted black place. Thank you very much. <coughs> the third story I like was the lavender lady. That's when this one was in 1868 and that was the year when clearly flooded and Cash Creek wasn't able to let the water up soon enough because the, uh, the Clear Lake Water Company, who was in charge of that and responsible for keeping the lake down to the right level, apparently couldn't manage the job. As a result, the lake not only flooded, but people living around the lake were forced to go into their barns and hire uh, country and uh, sleep. Their houses were flooded out, and there was fever and people died, and it was a serious time. Now that's an entire story, because eventually they went up there and they bought, dynamited the dam and, and uh, released all the waters. And on the other hand, the Curly Water Company said, we couldn't do anything different because there was a place later on filled with rocks, and we couldn't get the water out soon enough. Regardless of that, people were dying. In the summer of 1868, the Cash Creek Dam was tore down and sickness and fever rode the land. Many of the children, the old people, lay close to death. The poisonous high waters caused fevers, and the high water was because the Clearing Water Company refused to drain the lake. That was the claim at the time, and it may have been true. <coughs> the fever and illness came to two of the farm families in Scotts Valley that knew each other. Everyone knew one another. The two families, although they were not close friends, uh, they were acquainted. One of the friends had a, a boy about 11 years old. He'd been ill with a fever for several weeks, and he was getting worse all the time. Doctor told the grieving parents, you must prepare yourself for the worst. There is no hope for your son, I must tell you. I wrote the book. The night wore on, a soft breeze came in from the fields, bringing the older growing things. Bats haunted mosquitoes under a full moon. The trees shifted their branches in the wind. It was an unusual, peaceful night. <coughs> Parents sat by the boy's hand, dead, holding hands and moving only to smooth the child's sheets, or adjust the flame of the kerosene lamp. At dawn, the little boy opened his eyes and he smiled at his parents. Lulu is coming for me, he said. We're going on a long journey together. Who is Lulu? His mother asked. My friend. The little boy's voice was so low and husky, it was hard to understand. The mother and father had to bend forward to hear his last words, what he said. She comes and sits by my bed when you're not here or when you're asleep. She says that we must both go. She'll wait for me, so I will have company. The mother felt this thrill of fear. She had heard such stories before. There were tales about people who died and members of the family had come to escort a new member of that family into the realm of the dead. She was terrified. What does Lulu look like, she asked. Oh, Mama, she is old and her hair is dark. She wears a lavender dress with a funny pin with a lady's head on it. 
the boy's mother tried to ask more questions. Just at that moment, the boys took a sudden turn for the worse and died. The family buried the boy in Harvey Cemetery. In those days, people looked after their own cemetery lots. For weeks afterward, his mother went alone to the wagon, in the wagon to the cemetery to weed the grave and place a few flowers there. As she was bending over the grave, a shadow came between her and the sun. She looked up to see her neighbor, a tall woman with dark hair. I'm sorry about your boy, the lady said gravely. Thank you, answered the mother. I know how you feel because I lost my mother a few days before your little boy died. Losing a child must be even more painful, although my mother and I were very close. I was visiting from San Francisco when she caught the fever. Wanting to be polite, the mother said, I don't believe I've ever met her. What was her name? Lulu, her neighbor said. This cameo I am wearing belonged to her. She wore it during the funeral services because it looked so well on her new lavender dress. I removed it afterward because she wanted me to have it. <clears throat> For a moment, the neighbor was silent, but she added, she loved the child. <laughs> Very good for ghost stories. Uh, when I proofread the final edition of Lake County Histories, after I'd read it in maybe three or four weeks, five weeks in the past, I enjoyed the book. I enjoyed the book very much. I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> and when I write my column, which we the record be, if you've read about Cleo or about the peaceful people and the animals I've had. You know that I write, I write in a simple fashion so that people will understand and read it. And that's the way I write, just the way I talk. And I try to make the book a little bit so that the hundred or so stories start from the time that the noble rocks crashed and mumbled and created this wonderful county of ours and Clear Lake and the mountains and all the rest and five or six volcanoes that are now going around us. Uh, all the way into the Indian Wars and, and a brief history of California, it becomes really a serious story about America as well as Lake County. Uh, farming, suburban, urban America. Uh, and so I think that what we have in our county, which is so unusual, is something that after I did my research, I talked to everybody from Jim Brown, the other tribe, John Parker, everybody who give you time to speak with them, their ideas and thoughts in a recording. I began to understand for the first time myself what an unusual place we live in. So I was very happy that I wrote the book and I was even more surprised with its, with how popular it was. I'm nearly sold out. I've got enough here. I brought a bunch of books today. But I know that I've got 10 or 12 book signings I'm going to be out, so I will be ordered to go with passport books uh, in time so that I'll have some for future people that you're getting the first edition. That's my story. Thank you. Thank you. Now, as for the books, um, check credit card, anything you've got is good. Um, the older days they used to be in. Uh, apples and pears and trade them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that's certainly an option. But where do you want the books? Well, We've got some right here. Oh, you do? Yeah. Do you have here. a table where we can set up our table? I can get it. She has a table. So we can sign books at the bell desk. How about right here? You can sign them. We can use these right here. Oh, you've got it. And while well, Jean can set up, as you stand carefully and look under your chair. Where's your hands going right here? Sorry, just look under your chair. Okay, I'm paying for your book. I'm, I'm, I'm selling you short. <laughs> <laughs>
you have any questions or want anything that I've talked about, I'm happy to answer anything I can the best way I know how. David, could we move this to me up to sit? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, dear. I need to call every time I see you. Thank you so much. I you. I keep writing because people like yourself seem to enjoy it. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. system in Lake County at all? Have I said what? Have you studied the educational system in Lake County? The educational system. I should be during my hearing aid. I can hear well enough that I know it was where. But would you mind repeating one more time? Have you studied the educational system of Lake County? Yes. Uh, a little bit. I think that uh, uh, I talked to Dr. Balkenberg and they'll probably have a little in some of the schools, it's not a textbook, but I think the children of Lake County should know something of our history, and maybe even to the college level. And they're, they're interested in doing that. Uh, I was a teacher for three years in Detroit Public Schools, and I did teach in a session course on how to write in the library at Lakeport. But as far as an opinion, the that's what you're searching for, um, the status of our educational system, I'm not, <laughs> do you do you know of anyone in Lake County who's done any research on the educational system? I've talked to Juan Falkenberg. I know him. Yes. And I have what, is your, what, you know, what is your opinion? My opinion? Uh, it's not a very good one. <laughs> well, that's true. Most of the uh, United States uh, their yeah. educational system. We lack enough science, but we should be getting more girls in the science and specialized in science. 
doing something to educate our children in the colleges without costing them an arm and a leg. Yes. I feel that very strongly. I, I agree, but this is something that really bothers me, and that's labeling children. Uh, if children, and I'm not going to take up um, much time from your discussion because I'm enjoying it, but I think children shouldn't be labeled because if you label a child, they already have a disadvantage going into the education system. I agree. System. So that's one of my pet peeves. Okay. Any other questions? Sorry. Mm -hmm. When you're telling the story, do you take all of your characters' perspectives <coughs> into consideration, or do you focus on just one or two? I'm not sure I understand that question. Yeah, no. when, when, when you're telling your story, and you have a couple of different characters, do you tell your story from from their perspective? Well, first, that's a good question because stories can be told first person. Keep the light closer to your mouth, we'll hear you. That's a good question. Do I tell the story in, from a first person's perspective or some other perspective? It depends on what the story is. When a science fiction story was told first person, Tony was telling his story about how he was tired of having his android. Uh, Sidekick who knew was smarter than he was, thought she was Sherlock Holmes, she had a special tape in her, like Brian Brain. And he told the story first person. In the case of uh, uh, my columns, I tell the first person, I'm telling the story. In the case of the uh, court of conspiracy, the Civil War story, is told in third person. I'm telling about these people and I tell you Lincoln said this. and. Porter said this, and, and Robert E. said this to his men. So it depends on the story. There's no set way of doing it. When you're telling the story in third person, do you do you apply your own perspective on it then? Would I tell the story in third person? It was a Civil War story where I wanted to get my facts straight. I do not put my own perspective in it very seldom. In the Lake County History book, yes, I did. <laughs> A couple of stories were so incomplete, no matter how much research I did, that I was not satisfied. And I knew I was not satisfied. You might not be satisfied. So I said so. Uh, a stone jail they had in, in one of the towns. Prisoners kept breaking out of them all the time. I wondered, how in the world does the prisoner keep breaking out of this jail repeatedly? Well, they put uh, iron bars up, or well, I think there's a door on it. I mean, God. But when I talk about the hermit of, of Upper Lake, and her, like 40 acres up there, was told, and her story was told by another person who seemed to have a prejudice against her because her big muscles that were strong enough to throw uh, an intruder down the mountainside like possibly a fly in an inkwell was unladylike. When I said, this is a girl I would like to be. <laughs> so yes, I do put in my own feelings when it's a girl. I'd like to know, when, what is the year of the last, most recent story you tell in your book? How recent? Not how old, yes. but how recent? Well, I've covered the First Second World War and, and uh, Prohibition, of course up to nearly the present time. Okay. I did interview the police department and the social services and all the people, but I felt I had it as an additional part of the book, but I did not add it because it was so recent that I think if I was going to make a story out of that or a report out of that, it should be separate from our history. And so I would say it's up to, uh, right up to about 19, uh, roughly, uh, ending the Depression time when I was born in 1930, 35 before, and the rise of uh, the dictatorships in Europe and things of that sort before that. Uh, the Second World War was in it, but I didn't touch on much after that. The Second World War, of which I was a part of. Mm -hmm. And you said there is a second edition coming? No, I said that <laughs> I thought that it might be good as an additional part of the history, but I did not add what the current, current status of the different parts of Lake County are today. It, was, it did not seem appropriate as part of this history. 
So I stopped at the end of the World War II. Did you say there was a second printing coming? A second edition? Printing? A printing? Oh, yes. Publisher? Second printing. Right. Yeah, that's coming. Yeah. And the reason, I'll tell you why. Jim Brown stopped at my house last uh, Friday. And we sat in the front porch because I just come back from San Francisco visit for some reason why we should not go to the house. And uh, he's a good friend of mine. We sat in the front porch while Cleo watched this cat I write about. And she's very sociable. She's ready to jump out of Jim's lap. Jim told me that he had been informed that he was going to act as a director for an event in Washington the 29th of June. What it is is a reenactment of the marriage of Robert E. Lee to his wife, as part of our history, and then before that, when Martha Custis married George Washington and had several slaves, she freed those slaves, and two of the slaves, uh, which were not related, married each other, Mariah and John. And they were given as a wedding present 16 acres of a part of the land that Martha Custis owned which happened to be 320 acres, which happens to be the National Arlington Cemetery today, and which Robert E. was lived on when he uh, was alive. Well, that 16 acres was deeded to John and Mariah, and to this day, my friend, which is Vincent Syfax, has a right, and his relatives have a right, to compensation for 16 acres. And he's battling that matter now. And the event that's coming up might be a way of opening that door again. They can't get the land back as the cemetery. And their family marker is in it, the Custis marble marker. But it was so important that uh, when he brought that up, and it's chapter 64 of the book, that it uh, reminds me of how this is a living history, even today, to the present time. Any other questions before we begin? The On the Civil War, yes. uh, uh, down in Lower Lake, there's a lot of Civil War active people sure in, was. In, the, in the old cemeteries. Yes. And there are rumors about uh, some of them could have been uh, defectives and uh, also. Uh, what are we to do? Do you have that, anything like that in your books? Or do you have uh, anything to, to see what we're going to do about renovating that, that very valuable cemetery? Or, uh, I did, but I did, but all I did in the book was to sell the facts, to tell the facts of what it's, it's like today and the things that cause it to be what it, the condition of the cemetery is like today without giving any personal opinions as to that or what I, any suggestions for people in the historical society who help contribute this information have some definite ideas of restor restoration, but I didn't dwell on that. And to, uh, is there yes, you, uh, people that, from Lake County that actually went and fought with in the war, yes, so that way they came back? Oh, sure. Oh. There's an entire story. One man I've been collecting military stuff from the Civil War, and I, I have you? Uh, been back east and, and through some of the battlefields. And Is that war. right? That's an incredible, incredible war I've ever heard of in my life. Oh, yes, yes. Well, yeah. yes. I certainly agree with you. Yeah. It was people have no idea. The greatest maritime tragedy of all time far away the tragedy of the sinking of the Titanic was just at the end of the Civil War on the Mississippi, where 2,100 Union soldiers coming back from one of the terrible prisons in the South Jackson. were drowned because the thing blew up. Wow. Yeah. Yes, good for you. Well, thank you for that. that. I, I didn't know how much you was going to get into the history. Not deeply, except to tell from Lake County's history to something like this. <coughs> Civil War matters who they were, things of that sort. Is there going to be more on it at this re reindictment here at, uh, on the 14th? Yes, I'll be there. Okay. I'll 
Thank you. 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 Okay, we have some refreshments for you here. Please be careful, there's a step down. We don't want anybody stepping farther than they can.